uh, get started uh, with introducing myself. Uh, my name is Don Hatton. I blog online at uh, redpenmama.com. Uh, as I post on my Twitter name, redpenmama. I'm going to be talking today about um, blogging about grief, why people do it, how they do it, what resources there are out there um, on the internet if you are experiencing any kind of grieving or um, looking for any kind of support uh, because of the death of a loved one. Uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, I um, lost a baby boy in uh, 2003, June of 2003. Uh, he was stillborn. I was 37 weeks pregnant. Uh, I have been son I have three other children, uh, happy, healthy devils whom I love. Um, this is a repost of a blog post I wrote in 2007. Scared away. Um, <laughs> uh, I. I didn't start blogging until 2007. When I lost Gabriel, it was 2003. Uh, blogs were not what they are now. I mean, in 2003, it was very much in the live general stages still. Um, and then in 2005, 2006, blogging started catching on. More and more people were blogging. And um, as a professional writer, I wondered if I should blog also. Uh, in 2007, I had my second daughter, her name is Kate, and I inadvertently became a stay-at-home mom, and I knew that I needed to keep writing, that I needed to tell stories. Um, and I chose originally to start telling stories about my children, and my experience as a mother, and as an accidental stay-at-home mom, um, and it developed slowly, I slowly found my own voice. In November of 2007, I uh, discovered um, National Blog Posting Month, um, and I discovered that there was a community of baby lost parents, um, primarily mothers, but also fathers were there. And I, until that discovery, I had not realized that I could talk about this at all and tell a girl's story. Um, and it was very, very hard for me to do so because until that time I hadn't publicly talked extensively about my loss and my experience with the loss. Um, and like I said, this is a, um, a blog post that I reposted from that time. People experience grief differently and you learn to accept that. Um, and people also grieve differently, and of course, people blog differently. It's just the way that it goes. Um, so, um, the other reason I wanted to talk about blogging about grief, and um, particularly about baby loss grief, is I had a friend recently who DM'd me on Twitter and said, oh my gosh, my friend lost her baby, she was 32 weeks long, what do I do? What do I tell her? And I pointed her toward this site. This is a site called glowingawards.com. It was started by a number of uh, baby lost parents as a resource for other parents who are experiencing neonatal or infant loss. It is one of the best sites I have seen. Um, they deal with it um, very honestly and openly and also in such a way that you do realize that people grieve differently and people express their grief differently. And um, so this is a site that I've relied on. As you can see here, there are uh, discussion boards for uh, for people who um, need to talk about their losses but maybe aren't ready to blog or um, talk about it that way. Um, there are people who 
you know, talk about continuing to try to get pregnant after a loss um, and the unique stressors that that brings to your relationship uh, with themselves, with their significant others, with their other children, if they have other children. Um, the other uh, thing that I pointed my friend toward was this page on here, how to help a friend through baby loss. When someone, when someone loses anyone, especially someone close, a parent, a sibling, a child, you don't know what to say. And it's okay to say, I don't know what to say. Um, and this gives some tips uh, to friends who want to be there, um, who have questions about talking about it, who have questions about how to help a friend, you know, if there's anything to do to help their friends. Um, I know for me, these, these are all really good tips, and one of the things that I told my friend who had DM'd me was, use the baby's name, don't be afraid of that. The, that baby was a person, you know, especially if it's a, a stillborn, um, later lost, um, especially if it's an infant that was actually born and died in the most years, that, that baby was a person. Uh, use, the, use the baby's name. Try to remember anniversaries. They don't have to be a big deal, but it's an important, it's an important part of what your friend is going through. We all get busy. We all have our own lives. Um, the grieving person is the one who continues to grieve. And we do understand that people move on and that people go on with their own lives. But at the same time, we need to talk about these people who who left Mark in one way or another. Uh, moving on to talking more generally in grief, Slate did a series by uh, the writer Megan O'Rourke. She also published a book with the same title called The Long Goodbye. She lost her mom uh, to cancer uh, when her mom and she, I mean, were both fairly young. I mean, she was orphaned, I think, early 30s, late 30s. But, you know, her mom had been sick for a long time. She lost her mom, and she found herself in this position of grief. And she studied it. She needed to know more about it. And um, obviously, she wanted to write about it and talk about it. And it's a very good series um, that talks about uh, the experience of grief from the point of view of actually going through it. Um, grief is a strange phenomenon in that it comes at you in waves. Um, when it's the death of someone very, very close to you, a spouse, a child, again, a sibling, a very close friend who was like a sibling, you don't get over it. And we'll go back to going in the woods to examine that a little more closer. Uh, you don't get over it, and you won't. And what you need to know is you can get through it, you can survive it, but you're going to have some experiences that isolate you from other people who haven't had as close a loss. Um, if you ever Google, you know, the 10 most stressful things, death of a spouse is number one. It's the worst thing that can happen to a person. And again, it's hard to know what to do. It's hard to know what to say. So she talks a little bit about um, her experience of grief and uh, grieving in general. Um, and one of the interesting things that she has is examining the difference between uh, normal grief and complicated grief. To call grief normal is odd because it's a very unique experience. Um, but there is a normal progression or a normal... I don't want to say progression because that makes it sound like it has an end. But there's a normal um, cycle of experiences, let's put it that way. Even when you get to the point of acceptance, you know, in your grieving process, you can still experience the anger and the denial and the bargaining that, you know, those five stages 
five stages makes it, again, makes it sound linear, makes it sound like you're going to get to stage number five and everything's going to be fine, and it's just not. So complicated grief is when you can't, when you can't process it, when you can't come out of it, um, when you can't come out of the denial or one of the stages of bargaining or anger, um, you get stuck. And there's no uh, there's no way to uh, resolve what you're going through. Um, the other people she talks about here, Joan Didion wrote a memoir, The Year of Magical Thinking. She had lost her spouse, and um, her daughter was sick when she wrote that when she wrote that book. Um, and again, it's another examination of grief as we're going through it. Um, and then she talks about the uh, normal grief uh, versus um, versus uh, prolonged or complicated grief. Um, uh, evidence of um, studying complicated grief says that it suggests that many parents who lose children have more of this type of grieving rather than the quote-unquote normal grief. So um, one of the reasons that people blog about grief and talk about this on the internet is uh, to find support. Um, support groups, you know, modern-day support groups are a version of um, professional groups um, that would help, you know, help each other out in a neighborly way. There are uh, a, um, there are fill-ins for, um, for extended family. Many of us don't live with near extended family anymore. So we find these support groups um, to help us through these hard times. Um, Participating in a support group gives a person a number of things. One, you discover you're not alone, which the impact of that is such a relief. Discover that there are other people who have felt this way, who might still feel this way, who, you know, have continued on and can help you um, continue on. The other thing about support groups is they're a place where you don't have to worry about comforting other people. You don't have to explain your grief. You don't have to defend your grief. You don't have to justify your grief. You can be sad or however you are feeling, and no one will challenge you. Um, a lot of times when people in a it happens when people you know have an experience with profound loss. They want to know when you're going to get over it. They want to know why you haven't moved on with your life. If you lost a child, why, why aren't you having more babies? You're young. Not helpful. Not helpful. Um, I want to go back to oh, Glow in the Woods here. Um, they have Uh, I'm going to scroll through my site. Um, you know what? I'm going to go. Um, there are images here at the bottom of this post. There is me holding Gabriel, and there are pictures of Gabriel. Just, I want you to know. They're not graphic, but they are sad, maybe. But I want to go down here and uh, search here. One of the best things that someone said to me, it was at Gabriel's memorial service, was my uncle Jim had lost his son. His son was 22 years old. He died in a car accident. 
And um, my Uncle Jim came to me and he said, you'll never get over this. And it was such a relief that someone told me that. Because I didn't know if I was going to get over it. I felt pressured to get over it. I was married. I, I, my husband and I were barely married a year. We wanted children. You know, my, I wanted to give my parents other grandchildren. I, but when he said, you're not going to get over it. It was, a, it was a revelation. It took that pressure to get over it off of me. It said, you're, and this is, um, my post here says, um, you will feel better someday. When you lose a person, you will feel better someday. Even if you are experiencing complicated grief, if you get help, if you go into therapy to talk about it, which is something that I did after the real died, um, if you decide to go on medication because you're experiencing extreme depression, you know, you don't want to move, you don't want to keep living, um, if you get into complicated grief, um, get help. And again, regardless of who means lost. But someday, you will hold that earth. And that's hard here too, especially when you're fresh in the throes of it because you don't want to feel better. You want to feel this pain forever because you're afraid if you don't, you are forgiving the person, that you will, um, they will be lost. And even when you do feel better, they won't be lost. You will always have them. You will always have them. Um, and then another book that I found very helpful was called um, An Exact Replica, Replica of a Figment of My Imagination. It's a book by Elizabeth McCracken. Uh, she went through the same thing. Um, she lost a baby. Uh, in France, um, she's an American writer, she lost her baby in France and then experienced another pregnancy and she writes very, very beautifully about it. Um, I, I put off reading the book for a long time because I was like, oh, I've been there, done that. Why do I want to read this book? But she really um, captures it so well. And there's one part, again, I'm going to go back to my site here. Um, and she talks about this experience of meeting with a uh, deaf man. And he gives her a card and it says, I am deaf. And she wants a card like that. A card that says, by this baby is so blind. Because that explains so many things, especially if you're interacting with another pregnant woman or another parent. Um, especially when your loss is fresh. It explains so many things. Um, another source, um, which is online, compassionatefriends.org, um, is a good, uh, a good support group if you need someone in person, if you need to be in person with other people. The internet is great, um, the support groups on the internet that have developed are fantastic because they don't limit you geographically. You can talk at any kind of day to other people. You can post something and come back to it later and see what people have, have talked to you about or want to talk to you about. So the internet really has expanded support for all kinds of things. I mean, people go to support groups when they are sick or a loved one is sick. People go to support groups for loss. People go to support groups for all kinds of different reasons. Um, the other, the other reason that people blog about grief, and this is a local Pittsburgher, um, her name is Amy Unbrusco, 
and she lost her two uh, children in a car accident. And she started this blog. I did not start my blog to talk about Gabriel. I started it for my own reasons, again, to tell my own stories. It wasn't until I got into the blogging community that I learned I could talk about him, and that other people went through this and talked about it. Amy started her blog after the loss of her children. Um, that happens quite often. Um, people don't know where to go. People don't know how to talk about it. Um, and now they go online. So Amy started her blog, and one of the purposes of her blog, one of the purposes her blog has served, is to set up a memorial. I'm sorry, I'm putting down at my computer. He's actually doing it. Um, start a memorial uh, for Casey Peter's people. So she gets online to it that way. She gets feedback from people that way. Um, she's trying to set up a tree house in Chris Park for none of her children. Um, and this has been one of her vehicles for that. So, you know, beyond going online to find support and support others, creating a memorial, you know, online, or even in this case, you know, a real memorial. And then there is, she has, her blogging has fallen off as she processes her grief. Um, because that's what her blog was about. I don't know if she'll come back and start telling other stories. She recently remarried, you know, she knows she had children. But at this point, her blogging has slowed down. I think she concentrates a lot on the memorial. Um, and that, that happens too. Some people who start blogs and blogs every day, you know, that slowly can drop off or it can develop into something else. Um, and then there are other ways of grieving, there are other ways of finding support, uh, infertility support is very large uh, on the internet, there's a very large community for that, um, there's a, um, you know, Alzheimer's, you know, people who are dealing with dementia. Um, one of the other things that I have blogged about is, um, the death of my grandmother, she died about a year ago. Um, uh, and um, she had dementia for a very long time. I slowly lost my grandmother uh, before she died. And I wrote about that. This, I say that, as I say, this is, um, was written the year before she died, and then she died more than a year ago. It's, um, it's hard to forget that. Um, does anyone have comments or questions? I see fire home in the back there. You have your own specialty or way of um, blogging about something else there. Blog about, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about it. Uh, I love that. Oh no, you get way more than I get, honey. Oh goodness. Uh, those sitting on the next session when we talk all about that, I'm sure you have your own way of dealing with them. Cause that's just, I, I'll tell you something that is unique to internet support groups or internet um, support communities like adoption, like birth loss, birth loss. Um, baby loss matter is, uh, and I, I have seen this happen in the baby loss community, is someone comes on and pretends to be a baby loss. Uh, yes, you're shaking your head there. And I, I mean, who would want to pretend to be that? I mean, and it's, what is so heartbreaking about it is obviously the person is hardly, hardly ill to want to participate in this kind of community and disrupt it by pretending. Um, and it's disruptive because people will find out that you're pretending and say, well, you're pretending 
you have the people who believe the accuser, you have the people who believe the person pretending. It's very divisive. It's very divisive. Um, and that's, that's a danger of, I, of any support. I mean, I don't know how many people I've seen in fight clubs, but I mean, the same thing happens with two characters in fight clubs who go to support groups because you know, their own lives are so empty that they pretend to get this attention to having sicknesses. Um, anyone else? Are there any questions? Just how do you, do you write about the dreaming process of the new how much emotion do you want to put out there? I mean, I understand like what your situation and other situations is, it's a rough talk about mm -hmm. it's very deep. Um, so in your writing, I mean, that can come out very mm -hmm. late. I don't you know. Can draw, that can take people away. That is true. Um, I lost Gabriel eight years ago on his anniversary. I still write about it. Um, and yes, you're right. If, if I lose readers because of that, I mean, I'm a very small blog. I, I don't have high numbers. I don't have trolls. God bless. Um, but I'll tell you for myself and the way I am online is I'm, I'm what you see is what you get. I'm out there. I don't pull back on my writing. Um, I don't pull back on when I'm feeling free. I don't pull back when, yes, yeah, there are certain stories, and as a, you know, as someone who blogs about her kids, I'm starting to develop a filter there because Flora is sick. She can read. So, you know, I'm not going to put out there Flora was just a bitch today. Because in 10 years, if Flora's like, Mommy, I want to read your blog, or she's, you know, I heard your mom called you a bitch when you were sick. I don't want that. I don't want that. Um, so you do decide what you're going to put out there and what you're going to filter. When it comes to grief, I don't filter. Um, I'm eight years out. It's not as fresh. But I think it's important to keep talking about it because in some ways for the people when it is fresh. That's why I wrote that post on Glow in the Woods that says you will feel better. You don't want to hear that right now, but you can. Um, when I write about Gabriel now, it's, um, you know, still missing him. It's, there were a number of, Gabriel would have been eight in June, and I know a number of eight-year-old boys. And this is what they do. They kick soccer balls. They build tree houses. They. My boy is never my first son. I have another son who's in my goal. My first son's never going to do those things, and I, I have to deal with that on a daily basis. Um, last year he was seven years old, obviously, and it was a time of such. I was pregnant with Michael. I had. You have two other daughters that you have to care for, and it does become less raw because it becomes incorporated into your life. Now, I don't know, and I hope that I don't find out for 40 years, I don't know how that, how losing my spouse will do that to me. Um, you know, there's also divorce. Divorce is grieving. You know, that's grieving the loss of a relationship and how, how do people process that and does that end? When does it end? How does it end? Um, and that's, that's one of the things that, that I do continue to blog about Gabriel is to say, you're not going to get over this. You will get through it. You will move on. Your life will continue. Yes, the pain gets dollar. But you don't forget. I, I mean, and I guess that's I guess that's the other reason I keep doing it. She don't forget. Yes. What do you do when people say to you, why do you have to make that over again? I have never had anyone say that to me. What would your advice be to you? Because, yeah. I would say to someone who questioned my not being able to get over it, it would be 
hard to be polite because my first reaction would be to want to say, well, clearly you've never had this kind of thing happen to you. And that's, that's all too snarky. Um, there are some experiences in life you don't get over. If you are lucky enough to never have had an experience that you don't get over, good for you. I would never wish, I would never wish the loss upon a baby on anyone. Anyone. It's the worst thing that can happen to you. You know, again, barring the death of your son. It's the worst thing that can happen to you. I don't care if it's a stillborn baby, a two year old, a 10 year old, a 22 year old, you know, probably even 80 year old parents who lose their 40 year old son. There's no, the, there's a natural order to death. Parents die before babies. Parents die before kids. And when that natural order doesn't happen, your whole world collapses. And you, the fact that we can move on, the fact that we can continue on with our spouses, that we can continue on our lives is pretty amazing. I, I would say, <laughs> You know, I got through it, you know, I've continued, I'm never going to get over it. That's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, like, when you're writing about stuff that's happening to you, and you can share that level of, uh, one that's an emotion that you're out there, should you give yourself a great period in public? Should you give yourself a full 24 hour time frame of okay. Okay, tomorrow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this today, tomorrow I'm going to come back and read it. Is that a good idea to do, so you don't put something off there that you wrote and hate, or along those lines, or should it just be, this is how I'm feeling, you should get it out there? Uh, hmm. That's a good question. Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say that if you have that instinct, like, i got to hold off on this. I have written some very inner posts in my life, not about grief, but about other things that have happened, and I've sat on that. And there have been a couple times where I've modified things and published them, because, uh, again, my blog is who I am, it's what I'm going through. Again, not that many people read it. <laughs> They're probably like, who cares? That's fine. I'm not out there to make a ton of money. Um, oh, anyway, let's be honest. Um, but if you have that instinct, like, I shouldn't say, you should follow that instinct. I think that's a good instinct to have when it comes to blogging, because it is public. Someone's going to find you. Someone's going to find what you're talking about. Could be your child in uh, however many years. Uh, it could be, you know, your close friend who you bitch about because she didn't come to you or whatever. If you have an instinct to sit on it, then yes. I have wanted to write about like I've had a And that's not fair, because it's one side. And it's not my story, it's our story. And um, so I don't I don't publish those. Um, so yes, if you have that instinct, follow it. But eventually if you go back and say, Yeah, I'm gonna publish that. Do it. Don't second guess yourself for a long time. You know, if you need to cool off, if you need to wait till the emotion is less raw, definitely, definitely do that. Um, anything else? Anyone else have blogs about grief or resources about grief to carry out? I'm curious about um, you have to support grief. I'm wondering. Um, if you think there's certain obligations that people you know, get through the grieving process somewhere, and when new people come on, if you feel they're all obliged to maybe help them, then they're going to engage in that sort of thinking that you know, it's so long as they even though they'll just still be when mm -hmm. um, they engage in you know, thinking where they're going to make that mm -hmm. do you feel an obligation to in any way like, confront them out of empathy just so that they're, they're not hurting them? I think obligation is a strong word. I mean, I have reached out to people online and said, you know, again, with their post bundle on the work, you'll feel better. Um, yeah. 
Um, I have done that. I have seen it done. Um, I think it is helpful to tell a person. I think it's helpful to do in this way, to say what you're feeling is legitimate, what you're feeling is real. You don't, you know, it's not your fault your baby died, it's not your fault your spouse died, it's not your fault your sister died. But it's okay that you are feeling that way. I hope that you feel better if you want to talk more. You know, offering them some kind of, or even saying, I remember when Gabriel died and I thought, what could I do? What could I have done different? The answer is nothing. I mean, we went to the we went to so on and so forth. Nothing would have stopped Gabriel from dying, except maybe discovering something earlier in the pregnancy. But I had a normal pregnancy. We're still, we still don't know why he died. There are signs in my later pregnancies that might explain why. But really, we So, yes. Um, I think if you, I, and I think that's the purpose of support this in general. The compassionate friends, it's interesting because when you cut, when you go to a compassionate friends meeting, Dan and I went to probably only three or four. Um, we were both in individual therapy at the time also. When you go to a compassionate friends meeting, they say, I'm so sorry you're here. Because they know why you're there. And they don't say it's like, so sorry, I'm so sorry you're here. Well, I'm really glad because it's a step in going on. It's a step on in going through. Not to be no work of going through. So, yeah. We can have to people and respond to people. You know, it can, yeah, I can try to do that. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.